speakers who will be sharing their knowledge and expertise on the topic of reopening travel to Hawaii with a focus on Japan. Mike Mokini is the Director of the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, DBED. In his position, one of his responsibilities is to oversee the efforts of the state's reopening and recovery plan. Prior to joining DBED, Mr. McCartney was the Chief of Staff for the Office of the Governor, appointed by Governor Ige in December 2014. He was the past president and chief executive officer of the Hawaii Tourism Authority, HTA, the state's tourism agency. Eric Takahata serves as the managing director of Hawaii Tourism Japan, which is the official tourism office in Japan for the Hawaii Tourism Authority. The start of his 30 years of professional work experience began as sales manager for Sea Life Park and Atlantis Submarines, with a primary focus on the Japan, Korea, and China markets, and has since expanded into sales, marketing, public relations, and coordination in the Japan tourism, commerce, and Japanese sports and entertainment industries. Yoshikazu Kaz Kutara is the general manager of TTA Incorporated Hawaii Branch, where he leads a talented team of travel agents, welcoming more than 20,000 visitors from Japan, a year from Japan to Hawaii. Mr. Kutara has been both a service and sales professional in the hospitality industry, including lodging and travel in Hawaii and Japan for nearly 30 years. Steve Sombrero, is the president and principal owner of Cushman and Wakefield Cheney Brooks. He also serves as chairman of the board for the Japan America Society of Hawaii. Throughout his career, he has worked as an international business and real estate consultant to many Fortune 500 companies and Asia-based conglomerates. He is also the owner of Aloha Beer Company. Mr. Sombrero will serve as the moderator for the discussion today. Before we begin, a few housekeeping points. Each panelist will be making individual remarks. They will have 10 minutes each. The moderator will introduce each panelist with the topic to which they are speaking to. Attendees, you will be in listen-only mode. You will be muted throughout the webinar. Your video camera will also be off. Everyone will be able to see the panelists and moderator only. Welcome questions. Please type your questions in the Q&A box. Do not type your questions or comments into the chat box. Only those in the Q&A box will be addressed. You may type in questions throughout the webinar. Questions will be addressed after the three panelists are done speaking. When typing your question into the Q&A box, please indicate which speaker you would like to address your question to. Questions will be addressed in the order in which they are received. So now let's begin our panel discussion. Turning it over to Steve Sombrero. Thank you, Reina, for the introduction and welcome to our panelists, Mr. Mike McCartney, Mr. Eric Takahata, and Mr. Yoshikazu Kudara. Thank you very much. And we also want to welcome and send our alohas to all of our viewers who have joined us via Zoom, even some from Japan where it is nine o'clock in the morning, Thursday. Nihon no minasama, ohayo gozaimasu. And special thanks to all of our members and supporters and friends of the Japan America Society of Hawaii. If you are not already a JASH member, please consider becoming a member today by going to our JASH website, www.jashawaii.org. So let me begin our panel discussion today by describing the lay of the land. As of yesterday, June 16, Tuesday, our total COVID-19 positive cases was 740 with 92 requiring hospitalization. And so far we've had 17 COVID related deaths. Hawaii is ranked third from the bottom of the 50 states in terms of the number of COVID positive cases. The shelter in place and 14 day quarantine mandated in late March have clearly helped to flatten our curve and position Hawaii as one of the top three safest states in the nation. However, 
these mandates have resulted in dire consequences to our economy. Pre-COVID, daily visitor arrivals averaged 30,000 per day. Yesterday, our total non-resident, non-military visitor arrivals was 397. And hopefully all 397 are in their hotel rooms under quarantine. Over the last three months, Hawaii's unemployment rate shot through the roofs, and we currently have more than 150,000 people unemployed, with thousands of people continuing to file for unemployment on a daily basis. Yesterday alone, more than 7,300 people filed for unemployment. This should come as no surprise to anyone because roughly 25% of all jobs in Hawaii are connected to tourism. Restaurants and bars are especially hard hit, and we are told by experts that one in four Hawaii restaurants will probably not make it and will shut down for good over the next few months. Then you add retail stores, food and beverage distribution companies, hotels, taxis, and bus transportation companies all teetering on the edge. Meanwhile, the safety nets of the PPP monies and unemployment insurance are about to run out shortly. Clearly, we are in a very desperate situation, and unless we find a way to reopen our economy for visitor industry soon, we are headed for irreversible economic consequences. Today, we are joined by our panelists to discuss how and when we can expect to reopen our visitor industry, particularly with Japan. I'd like to begin with Mr. Mike McCartney, Director of the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. Mike, thank you for joining us today in our JASH Japan Travel Update. Let me jump right into some questions. I have three for you, and please answer them in any order. Number one, other regions like Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam, and even Guam are now starting to establish travel corridors, travel bubbles, if you will, with Japan. When can we expect to see a travel corridor between Japan and Hawaii? And two, we are hearing more and more about sustainable tourism. What is the number of tours that Hawaii should accommodate to be sustainable? And three, what can we do as a local community to support your reopening plans? So, uh, aloha, and thank you, Steve, and aloha to everyone out there. Um, mahalo for taking the time to be on this important call. And um, on behalf of my boss, Governor Ige, um, I'd like to wish you the very best. And first of all, Steve, to add to your first question, um, it was, when are we gonna open? Yes. Was that the first question? Yes. Um, we are going to open when it is safe, safe for our residents, safe for our visitors. And so we wanna be the best host possible so when we took on this effort, we knew that the whole world was going to go through change. And every destination, every place in the world had to make some difficult decisions about who they are and how they want to address the issue of the coronavirus. So I would say for Hawaii, what we are doing right now is we are pivoting. We're pivoting from being fearful of the virus to being respectful of the virus. And that's a change in who we are and how we're going to start working because the whole world has learned about the virus. We're learning about how tricky it is, but we're learning how to address those tricks. And we're learning how to keep our people safe, even though it is a, a tragedy and a challenge. But we are getting smarter, not only with technology, but most of all, how to do contact tracing and how to have hygiene and how to have good practices so that we don't make ourselves or each other sick or overload systems. So I think the whole world, including Hawaii, is getting confidence. So it was a very difficult decision, but a one, one that had to be made. And we knew that we were gonna suffer a lot of consequences for closing it down. And we also knew that it would probably be harder to open up than close down because there are many factors that we didn't realize as we start to open up. And so we are working very hard the governor is personally involved um, working on this, working with Eric and a team of us um, and all of you, um, talking to some of the highest level leaders in Japan um, from a government to government relationship. And we're asking permission because permission is about respect so we can work together with them 
and so that we can look at our different levels of um, and make sure that they understand that Hawaii is safe and maybe we're different from the rest of the US, but we want to ensure them that Hawaii is safe and when is Japan ready to travel? And then we've been talking to our dear friends, our travel partners who we're very, very close to and, and those communications are starting to happen and have been. And so we're working to coordinate that effort. Uh, my hope and dream is that um, visitors from Japan may end up being some of the first to come if, it's, if they're ready and we're ready in a place that is very safe and enjoyable. And, um, and it's not just about money. This relationship with Japan and us goes back over time, back to Meiji, you know, back to King Kalakaua and, our, and how we have relationships with each other that go deep and long. And so it's not just about a ROI or money or jobs. Um, it really is about a way of life and keeping the connection between our two communities and our families. And so opening up travel is more than a business. It's about reconnecting our families. So the governor is very committed on this. We have a, another meeting this afternoon and Eric participated in meetings yesterday. And so we're working hard on those plans because we want to ensure that um, we don't open and then we have to close again. And so we're, we're, we're working hard to set a target date um, so that everyone can rally around and work towards. Um, and we understand that each market is a little different. So we're working with each unique international market um, and Japan being the one that we, I think we have a very close and strong relationship to. So uh, I hope that answers the question. And so we want to partner with you and please be patient as we go forward. And I think the other question is how can you help I think everyone knows what we need to do and to have those conversations with government leaders. And it's not to push, it's to ask. Asking permission is about respect, to work with each other, to say, how can it work for Japan citizens? How can it work for Hawaii citizens? How can it work for um, each business that um, participates in this? And how do we keep everyone happy and safe? And, and how do we do it together? And so it's, it's that kind of conversation that will build a long-term partnership. It's not just pushing and saying, we're ready, we want this. Um, and I think that Japan and Hawaii have a different relationship. And so it's gonna be deeper, stronger and sustainable. And so where people can help is not so much spending your time on, um, is it gonna be level three to level one and what's the reciprocal thing for the US and you know, what is the prime minister staying and what is the governor saying and what is JTB and HIS and oh, Jiao and they're gonna fly. No, um, we need your help in talking to your friends, your neighbors, your brothers, your sisters, your uncles, your aunties, because um, one, we need to know that they're safe and they need to feel safe and that we're, we're the virus is something that we don't need to fear that we, um, we are now able to respect it and do many things. And to start talking about, can we start welcoming our friends from Japan and our family and in each community? Because um, we don't want communities to start raising concerns and not um, being ready. And we can have a PR campaign and we can have all these things to say, here it comes, but people to people, you know, um, so you have a tremendous network out there and it's not just in your work community, it's in where you live. And you know, um, Japanese travelers are rated number one by the travel industry every year by travel agents around the world. And um, I, I believe that um, the market can come back even stronger than what existed before. And I think maybe sometimes we put it on automatic pilot for no one's fault on its own. Now this will put us together to build even a stronger relationship that our children's children can be um, very proud of and we can change the trajectory of tourism. And sustainable tourism is gonna be more, having more green, you know, energy efficient, um, zero emission, you know, food sustainability and having food from Hawaii and matching people, place and culture. And people come here to experience who we are. And um, I think it's, it's going to evolve and change. And, um, but it's still going to be the heart and soul of what Hawaii is about, that, that feeling of um, who we are as a people and that aloha spirit. And aloha is not something to be sold. 
it's not about service, but it's about who we are. And um, and I think that's what everyone experiences. There's a way of expressing that in Japanese and a way of expressing that in Hawaiian. And um, that's a special relationship. So um, I think the industry will evolve over time into a new product. Um, and uh, a lot of people are working on that. And that that is going to be about clean energy, food sustainability, and, and having a, a different types of experiences. So when you look at carrying capacity and how many visitors, I think we have greater distribution that could take place on the neighbor islands. If Kona is an international airport and great experiences there. So as our friends and family from Japan come, we want them to experience the Hawaii we know too. And, and those parts of Hawaii want um, visitors to come. And so there's tremendous uh, opportunity to see and experience um, different places in Hawaii, like having Kona open as an international airport. And, um, so I believe that you can accommodate a lot of people as long as we put the right infrastructure in place, have the right um, community um, understanding, and then we start to um, distribute it even across the islands. And um, I think that's possible to and to do that in a way that sustains business and uh, going forward. And so um, I wouldn't just look at it as a hard carrying capacity. I think as we innovate and we, we take care of our infrastructure, and we take care of our needs, then you can begin to accommodate different kinds of capacity. And I think that's what we're doing to become a smarter um, destination and to find that proper balance where the residents are happy and the visitors are happy and it all comes together. So um, I see more hope than, um, than negative. Yes, there are challenges, but the challenges are great opportunity because I think we can build something stronger and sustainable. We're just gonna to have to work hard together. We're gonna to make mistakes. We have to try. If we make a mistake, let's just um, fix it and keep going forward. And, um, and it's gonna be, and as long as we keep doing that, um, it'll be fine. And um, so we want to welcome visitors back and we're looking forward to um, friends from Japan coming back to visit and being a part of our economy because my family wouldn't have the life it has today if it wasn't for all those who took the first step, you know, back during Governor Ariyoshi's time and Governor Mansfield and um, the Prime Minister back then, and, and you look at all that, um, that's probably why my kids could go to college. And they took a big risk back then to um, create that. And so I think we have the next responsibility to um, create the next future. And um, it's in our hands now. So thank you. So Mike, um Real quick, I, I'm not going to hold you to it, but we have listeners right now whose rents are due. They haven't been able to pay rent. We have people that have borrowed money for the bank and their bankers yes. are all over them. We have employees, I mean, people with employees that are, have been furloughed and, and they need to tell their employees when they're going to reopen. So I, I'm not going to hold you to it, but in your mind, ideally, when do you think, what is the earliest we can reopen uh, the visitor market to Japan here in Hawaii? Um, we hesitate to name a specific date until we answer a few questions that are being looked at now. And one of them, we are going through it right now with um, starting up neighbor island travel just yesterday. And each neighbor island has unique concerns about visitors and their impacts. So the mayors and governors are talking in a very collaborative way. And so that discussion is taking place. What I hope will happen is that we can start doing something towards the end of this summer or early Q3, right? Or end of um, the summer to start making things happen. And maybe there's things that we can start doing like charter flights or like start starting up a few things to get the momentum going. Because we, we can't, I don't think just open up what I like, and this is me speaking for myself, maybe we can start with a few and, and start, and it, maybe it's not gonna help everybody, but that whole experience of having um, groups of visitors start coming back, maybe even before August if we can, if we have the right protocols, to start giving everybody hope and say, wow, well, look, they're doing it, it's working, right? And look at that prototype, and maybe this one in Kona, maybe this one, um, in um, Honolulu and um, 
um, how do we um, do that and what's the experience in it? How do we share it? And then people will start seeing it working the, from the workers uh, to the businesses, to the guests. And um, um, so I think, you know, we're, we're working on all that to create um, a so-called travel bubble because I think we know that Japan um, is just like Hawaii, that um, we, we did a lot of things to keep things safe. So there's a natural fit to work with Japan and Hawaii um, and um, to find that and it, where the visitors will be safe here and the guests will be, um, the residents will be safe here. So Steve, everyone's pushing really hard. You know, when I say the word push, yes, um, to find that target date so people can plan because we know people have to also make plans and they're, they're, they're making those financial decisions, investors, and um, do I keep paying for um, people's insurance? Um, so I, I would hope that within the next 10 days or so, we can set some kind of target like that based on what's happening in the world with the virus, what's happening um, with our neighbor island travel, and then to start roll that out. And then um, I think the conversations that are taking place government to government um, are helping to, um, I guess, accelerate that. So I wish I could give you a date to here, but um, my official thing is sooner than later, and um, that would be my hope and wish. Um, and you know, we just have to make sure everyone's ready. So um, it's late summer, um, um, or Q, you know, Q, you know, sub September, but. You know, one of the things that's a marker in our mind, too, is that there are many events that happen. So we want those events to stay in place so that we can start planning and people can start buying and booking. So we know that it's all about the booking and everything else, too, so that you have enough lead time to make those kind of business decisions that, um, and, and then start um, educating people that the market is open. So I, I know it sounds like I'm dancing around the answer, but I can't give you the exact date yet. But the urgency, I want to let everyone know, is there and it's one of the governor's, it is one of the governor's main priorities. Um, every day we are working on this and um, um, I'm getting closer and, and, and there's many of you in this room who have helped to make that happen and put that together. Yeah. So um, thank you and, and we want you to be part of this whole thing with us uh, because it's gonna take the whole community to make it happen. I think each one of us have a role and then, um, We'll fit it in and keep communicating. And um, I hope that answers your question. Um, at least I hope they know you can feel my intent and the governor's intent. Thank you, Mike. Uh, please stick around because we have a Q&A towards the end. Uh, let me move to Eric Takahata. Eric, thank you for joining us today in our JASH travel, Japan Travel Update. Let me jump right into some questions related to your work as director of the ACJ under the Hawaii Tourism Authority. Number one. Japan has managed the global pandemic better than most countries, including our own. However, consumer expectations have changed dramatically. When the Japanese finally return to Hawaii, what are they going to expect in terms of services on all levels? Air travel, hotel accommodations, retail, restaurants, transportation, and attractions. And two, are the Japanese visitors really ready to return to Hawaii? Will they be willing to adhere to the safety protocols like pre-testing 72 hours prior to boarding their flights? And what are their primary concerns about traveling to Hawaii? All right. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Steve, and thank you, Director McCartney, for you know, your leadership, along with Governor's leadership on this whole situation. And um, you know, what I'd like to add about this situation is almost like that Rubik's Cube, right? We've all played with the Rubik's Cube. And when you move a certain way, you have to shift this, and then you have to flip this around and you got to move and everything's shifting like a Rubik's cube. So um, it's really hard to, uh, you know, define this, this situation. And uh, at least that's my view of it. And I know that, um, you know, Director McCartney and the governor are working very hard to, to make this happen. Um, especially reopening to Japan, which is such an important market uh, for Hawaii. And um, so when we look at Japan, we look at the infection rates, for example, you know, from a macro level, we look at the infection rate per capita, um, I think Japan is about somewhere around 150 per million uh, in their population. And so when you look at it from that uh, perspective, you know, here in Hawaii, I think we're at about 700, you mentioned earlier, what was the case uh, count, uh, Steve, 700? Right. 
some some around there, right? So 700 per per what our, our population here is about 120 million, right? 120, 130 million statewide. So when you look at a per capita, uh, I'm sorry, 1.2. I'm I'm saying Japan's Japan's uh, population about 1.2, 1.3 million here, right? So when you look at a per capita. Uh, uh, infection rate, you know, Japan is doing really well managing this, this virus. And so when uh, we look at it collectively from Hawaii's perspective, you know, Japan certainly is a, is a core or is a destination or a place that we can somewhat feel more comfortable, comfortable about from their infection rate level and a public health level. Um, and I know that's something that's playing into the decisions that, that are being made right now to open up Japan as a travel corridor. Uh, and, and much like within country in Japan, the new normal is, it is very different. I mean, you know, you, you talk about just going out to eat a meal. Um, you talk about just going out to, uh, you know, your, your, your local supermarket or your, um, you know, even whatever you do in daily life. It's very different in Japan. And with the safety protocols that have now been installed um, in many Japanese businesses, um, I think that the, 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 you know, wherever you are, whatever country you're in, your new normal is, is somewhat probably at a base level, um, probably very similar to what everybody else is doing uh, in, in other countries. So when the Japanese visitor comes here to Hawaii, I'm, I'm, they're going to expect that it's going to be not be the same old Hawaii, right? We can't, um, we can't locally, we can't even hug. We can't even give, you know, our culture is very, <laughs> we're very, you know, we're very, huggy, kissy kind of people, right? So um, we can't even do that locally anymore. So um, the Japanese visitor is definitely going to be ready for a different type of experience in Hawaii. Um, of course, including social distancing, um, you know, wearing a mask, which the Japanese uh, are very used to. Um, but we're going to see more and more people wearing masks uh, and so on and so forth. So um, when you look at it from a journey standpoint, right, they get to the airport. The airport's going to have protocols in Japan. And we're already working with uh, uh, JHTA and JATA in Japan and the Japanese government. And they're telling us what those protocols are at the airports. And then once they get through the gates after the check-in, uh, you know, their, their protocols are going to be very different. They're going into the airplane. And we see um, the airplane, the airlines, uh, adopting, adapting all kinds of different protocols that they've installed now into, um, you know, on board and with the aircraft equipment. And even with changing out the filters, even changing out the number of times the air is uh, circulated through, you know, the airline or the air, the aircraft. You know, I was told by uh, airline, uh, I talked with the airline expert earlier today, but they said in order to conserve fuel, they didn't circulate the air out as much, uh, as many times per hour as they are doing it right now. So now it's every three to five minutes that they're circulating the air out through a HEPA filter. Um, and this is at least true of gel and uh, ANA. And, um, and it's, you know, as, as, a, as a traveler, you feel really comfortable when you hear these things, you know, that in the, air, in the aircraft, you know, it's very, uh, very clean. Um, they, of course, they sanitize, they do everything that they can. And you're going to see um, the flight attendants wearing masks, um, maybe even face shields, uh, definitely gloves. Um, there's going to be people the restroom uh, on board, you know, in the aircraft. So when the Japanese visitor comes, comes here, they're, they're going to expect a very different Hawaii. Uh, and, and, and whatever that looks like, and, and I know that we're doing a great job as a state as well, you know, um, installing these safety protocols uh, into our businesses. And, and, and you know, I, and what we're trying to do uh, over at HTJ is, is uh, and, and I learned this from, from Mike, but, it, you know, we're, we're trying to do everything with Aloha, right? So we can have safety protocols, but... You know, this is a special place. Hawaii is a special place. So whatever we're explaining to the Japanese visitor through our messaging, we want to do it with aloha, with care, with, with the kind of people that we are. And, um, you know, you can go to whatever destination and experience different safety protocols. You know, Japanese people travel all over the world. But at least when they come here, we'd like to even be different in that sense when they experience our safety protocols and how we handle, how we're handling this pandemic. And then um, I, I think I want to uh, address your second question. Uh, are they ready? Uh, without a doubt, they are ready. I'll tell you. Uh, I've seen survey after survey after survey. Um, I saw one put out by the Japan Association of Travel Agencies uh, in Japan. Um, this was a month and a half ago. It came out. The results came out. Um, and uh, the number one destination that the Japanese traveler wants to come to, foreign, foreign uh, destination, 
after this pandemic is, is kind of under control. Undoubtedly, it's Hawaii, and, and, the, and the results were published, and that got into the Japanese media. So we've already had three um, news requests um, to cover Hawaii and, and, and you know, how, how we're handling at the airport, what it looks like here on the ground um, when you go to places like Waikiki or Hanama Bay or, or wherever, you know, many, many different, you know, uh, attractions and, and natural, beauty, uh, natural resource uh, attractions that we have around the state. You know, they, 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 they're wanting to come here. They're just clamoring for it. And um, I will share with you guys the latest uh, survey that we took as uh, Hawaii Tourism Japan. And our sample size, size, I'm very proud to report, was the biggest by, 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 by far. You know, we, we had 11,700 11, uh, respondents to our survey. And the results were very, very encouraging. So out of that, 30% um, of our 11,700 respondents said that they would come between this summer and the end of this year. 30% of, of, of our respondents. The next 40% said they would come between New Year of next year and summer of next year. And the remaining 30% are kind of like we would come, you know, Q4 of next year into 2022. Well, what's interesting when you look at this is, is uh, it was very eye-opening for us, and, but we, we kind of knew it was going to be somewhat like this, is that the heavy repeater, the, the person that's been here five to 20 times, they're clustered in the in the beginning, like they're going to be here, <laughs> they're going to be one of the first on the planes coming here, and, and the first thirty um, percent of the people. And then that kind of just interesting because as you go down the timeline, you know, it's the people that have been here maybe say one to three times, and then a lot of first timers and so on and so forth. So the more times you've been here and you know what Hawaii is about and, and you've fallen in love with it as a Japanese person, they're they're more you know apt to come here as soon as possible. And as the, the visits get uh, less and less, then you know, they kind of string it out further down the timeline. But um, you know, I, I, all of the studies, all of the things that we, we've talked with, you know, especially with the Japanese government through JADA, through JHTA, through uh, you know, Japanese media, um, I mean, Hawaii is tops. You know, we, they want to come here. And so we're ready and we're working to get these uh, protocols in place and especially this travel corridor that you were referring to and um, everyone's working very hard to get that done. So, I mean, uh, we're, we're very bullish and positive on the Japanese market moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. That's a very interesting study and uh, survey. It's, it's really reassuring, and it probably segues perfectly to uh, my ne our next panelist, Mr. Kutara. Kutara-san, thank you for joining us today in our JASH Japan travel update. Let me jump into some questions. Um, first of all, TTA, your company, has been one of the most successful tour packaging companies in Japan. Today, we are talking about a whole different kind of tour package. It's called the travel bubble. Do you think that the Japanese travel traveler will be willing to follow strict travel bubble programs, which will include pre-testing at the airport and prior to the airport, contact tracing, and ask to only go to pre-approved certified travel partners, restaurants, and attractions? And secondly, when we finally reopen Hawaii back to the Japanese, which market segment should we be targeting first to ensure that our travel bubble will be a success? Are they the family travelers, the office ladies, the business travelers, schools? What do you think? Uh, you're on a, a mute. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Makatani, and thanks, Eric, uh, for having me today. Um, you know, uh, even only the last year only, you know, more than 1.5 million travelers, visitors from Japan are visiting Hawaii. I still remember when, you, when we used to have more than 2 million people coming to Hawaii from Japan, maybe last, I mean, uh, late 90s. That's a huge numbers. And, and, and then the study shows that are, um, from the last year, nearly 70% of them are repeating guests from Japan to Hawaii. It's again, yeah, huge numbers. And the frustration, you know, um, those repeaters especially, they are frustrated right now for not being able to come to Hawaii since March this year. And then those frustration are coming from, you know, two major factors. Uh, one in Hawaii, we have 14 day quarantine. And the other one in Japan, they have um, infectious disease advisory levels which is right now in three. 
uh, level three is telling the people not to travel overseas. Um, so I believe when those doors are open, you know, Japanese tourists for sure will start to uh, coming back to Hawaii, for sure, yeah, guaranteed. Um, especially those uh, heavy repeaters, they're gonna be first, uh, who's gonna get on the board. Um, but our, we still have miles to go, you know, it's not easy because even at the Japan side, uh, those uh, PCR test kits are not enough. I heard they have only 200 to 300 kits ready and it's not gonna be uh, enough to accommodate those tourists. Uh, and also their inspection system itself have to be reviewed and gotta be newly you know, introduced to uh, the market. Otherwise, again, they're not gonna be able to accommodate those tourists at airport in Japan side, yeah. Um, and then, you know, just thinking of uh, Japanese characters, they tend to follow rules. It's tradition, their characteristics. So when we give them a clear instruction ahead of time, they will follow, yes. Um, and then, you know, all those conditions, including a travel bubble, travel corridor, you, you call it, um, should be mainly accepted by Japanese tourists. Again, if it's instructed clearly first. Um, you know, those trouble bubbles, I look at those contents and I think it's gonna give a, uh, you know, some kind of sense of security to the Japanese market uh, because it's, it's clearly um, the response to COVID-19 and pandemic, so. Um, and then, uh, but on the other hand, if there are too much um, physical tests, testing or um, you know, the examinations or too much cost to them may not be you know, uh, welcomed by the Japanese market. Um, and then uh, the second question you're asking uh, is, uh, you know, what's market segment might, 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 uh, gotta be uh, first to come back to Hawaii? It'll be, again, repeaters, Again, it'll be a, uh, individual travelers. Um, unfortunately, not a group businesses. Um, it'll be taking long for us to have those mice or group business back in Hawaii. Um, maybe difficult for this year, maybe difficult for next, um, you know, quarter one next year. Um, and then waiting might be another difficult segment. But, uh, you know, those, um, uh, individual travelers who love Hawaii keep coming back to Hawaii. Yeah, I'm sure they're gonna be, um, you know, back over here, even we uh, when we open the doors. Uh, so I guess we as a wholesalers need to focus more on enhancement in a package store planning to attract the travelers, and then that is to work with, um, um, you know, certified. Uh, local stakeholders in Hawaii. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to go jump right into questions now. We have several uh, questions coming in through the Q&A box. I think this first one is uh, addressed to Mike. Um, the question uh, it says, you say that we'll reopen when it's safe. What's your definition of safe? Infection rate, additional testing? For sure. Um one of the metrics is the infection rate, and that's what's um, being used. So definitely Japan and Hawaii have a low infection rate, and we're providing that de data to Japan as we speak to demonstrate that, because I think sometimes that happens where we get mixed up with the whole U United States market and those numbers. So we're showing our specific numbers, you know, and our in infection rate and per capita and that's the, the number we're using for that and then safe i think is um using the experts and the experts say that from the cdc that it's being able to track and trace people it's not necessarily only going to be tests because tests are not foolproof and neither is thermal scanning but what is foolproof and the best we have is that can I get in touch with you if you're sick? Can you get in touch with me? Can we start 
uh, contacting the people who you're with to make sure it's not spreading. And then can we have that communication? And then we can easily begin to stop the spread of the disease that way without creating fear, without creating um, commotion. And I think that's what SAFE is. And so we're getting better as a destination to do that. And I think what, what SAFE is, is that we have a responsibility as hosts. And so when we can say, um, we feel safe inviting you and we can actually take care of you, please come. And that's what we're working on right now. Every day, we're trying to make sure that we can deliver on our promises and protocols, whether it's walking through the airport or whether the hotel rooms are clean or whether we have those travel partners that can provide that experience or whether we have the right health care. And um, we're working on that every day because we know it's our responsibility as the host to ensure that our guests are safe and we want to feel safe. So that's, I think, going to be something that we have to communicate in our branding and messaging also. And, um, and we're going to work very hard with Eric on that. Um, but thank you. Uh, this next question is probably addressed to uh, Eric. Um, if you had to guess, will we have the Honolulu Marathon this year? Um, and like, like all the other events? Uh, or if not, you know, how bad is that going to be for us if we didn't have the Honolulu Marathon? I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm confident. I feel confident that we, we, we are probably going to be able to pull off the marathon. Um, and of course, that's just me. Um, you know, this is going to involve a lot of obviously people uh, in the decision making. But um, yeah, I think that the um, I would say that we would we would anticipate that the Honolulu Marathon will be happening this year. Uh, director, you think director has a comment? Um, to let everyone know out there, um, DBED supports the Honolulu Marathon and is doing everything we can to support them and they know that we are there to help them because we want to see this traditional event that means so much to our community happen and Dr. Barahal has been doing a wonderful job and it's a community event and it's also an event that attracts um, our friends from Japan to create this beautiful event and so if anyone is going to do it it's them and I have tremendous confidence in their ability their um, innovation and to keep it safe and so i want everybody to know that dbit is a hundred percent behind them and um i, I believe they're going to make it also okay thank you um this is from a george uh what strategy has been or already is being created with video and or print media to reach out to japan any inquiries on filming typical travel, variety shows, TV commercials, movie filming. Um, so this is open to anyone that can answer this question. Um, Eric, you might want to talk about a few things, but today the governor and the film industry, we had a, um, a conference and we're working hard to make sure we open up the film industry for Hawaii and um, make sure that some of the visa or permits that maybe got rejected um, Get, can get back into place and I, we're ready we're soon going to start opening up the film industry as well as it relates to and it's connected to also the travel industry and therefore it's, it's very parallel and we had a very positive meeting and um today and those are one of i think the announcements that are coming out to um to to ensure that things like commercials to even movies to magnum pi can can start going again Eric, you might want to say something about the yeah. Yeah. So we're, you know, uh, you know, we're very confident that it will be on the visas and you know, so on and so forth. Um, very confident that, that that's going to be taken care of. As, uh, the question of how many inquiries we're, we have from Japan already, it's, we can't count them. We've had, we have a lot uh, in the pipeline here. And uh, not only for news, but variety shows, um, you know, your, your, uh, your regular tabibangumis and 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 you know we get we get a request almost every day and you know when is it going to be you know when are you going to be ready and all this stuff so um the demand is there for for filming here definitely and so yeah rest assured that the, there's a lot of demand from japan to film here be it commercials be it uh, programming be it all of that stuff okay um this question appears more than uh, 
twice uh, and here's a concern is there any concern about japan's low testing rate they're not testing as much as korea for instance are we concerned about that no <laughs> Where uh, HTJ is not Kutara-san, maybe you want to answer. <laughs> well, I'm not sure, but you know, the, the, the fact is that they have very small number of death cases in Japan. So, you know, that's one of um, the numbers that we should focus. And then we can just say, maybe, yeah, Japan is safe. <laughs> yeah. You know, the recovery rate also, Steve, I'll point out, is, is, is up over 80, it's a high 80 percent percentile in Japan for the recovery rate. Uh, I, I looked up the number before we jumped on this call, but yeah, so the recovery rate in Japan is, is very favorable too, so, um, you know. You know, but I've heard uh, from a, a friend in Japan that most Japan people are afraid to take the test because they don't want to know if they have it or not. And if they do, they're going to get discriminated. They're going to lose their jobs and so forth and so on. So I, I wonder if that's probably one of the reasons why the, the testing rate is low, but that's to be discussed later. Um, next question. This is from a Daniel. Eric, thanks for the survey. Um, well, it shows Hawaii as a clear number one international destination. Uh, is there a movement in Japan to stay domestic and rediscover their own country? Well, we're all in lockdown borders, trends are difficult to determine, but what behavior is actually happening in Japan right now? Are Japanese traveling domestically and internationally? So I would, I would say for any country that's trying to restart travel and tourism, right, that's going to be your approach. Look, look at our own state. We started with Inner Island. So that's almost like domestic travel for us, right, within our own state from going from island to island. Um, and we restarted that way. So very much what the Japanese government is doing to now restarting domestic travel and I know that the uh, Japan Association of Travel Agencies which is the governmental arm for travel or tourism in, in Japan which reports to the Ministry of Tourism in Japan uh, is definitely looking at restarting domestic tourism first um, and, and that's all nice and fine but then we have these surveys that say that they a lot of them want to come here to Hawaii so uh, you know definitely domestic travel is already starting to happen Japan and being promoted, but uh, turning right on the heels of that is, is you know, Hawaii as a destination to come to. Hawaii, uh, may I just interject? Hawaii is domestic travel for Japan. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> uh, okay, um, this is for Kazu. What is your, this is from uh, Kevin. What is your prediction on the return of school group Shugaku Ryoko to Hawaii? Um, yeah, well, actually, um, we're receiving more and more inquiries regarding to school trips to Hawaii for next year onwards, but not this year. So, but our, um, the problem we have right now is that our, our schools, local schools here in Hawaii, who's going to be partner with Japanese uh, schools or educational programs or partnership programs or you know, exchange programs. Um, we have um, many schools here in Hawaii kind of hesitated to accept Japanese schools right now, even for next year. That'll be a little bit, um, you know, um, issues to, to uh, you know, call those um, Japanese schools back to Hawaii. We need to work on that very hard. But uh, hopefully next year, uh, starting from Q1, um, doesn't matter what size is, small, small groups, are from 20 students to, you know, big one going to be uh, more than 500 schools well, coming back to next year. But uh, we still need to, you know, some areas to work on. Uh, this is also to you, Kazu. Uh, this uh, question is about travel to Japan. Because as you know, corridor means it goes both ways. So this question is, my company is planning a large business conference in Tokyo next fall. Will Japan be open and ready to receive this many people? What protocols do you think are going to be expected? And I think um, before fall, we're even going to have the Tokyo Olympics in 2021. So I'm thinking that we'll, Japan will be open for business. But do uh, you have any thoughts on this? Well, sounds a little bit tough for now. 
Well, well, Japanese governments are preparing for welcoming um, businessmen, business sectors from um, um, certain selected countries, such as um, Australia, New Zealand, and Vietnam. Uh, Island, I guess. But only from the business sectors. Try to, to lower, you know, the duck for them to enter Japan. But it's just happening or maybe happening right now. So it's hard to predict all those incentive groups or conventions coming to Japan after Olympic Games. We, we have a little, you know, we're um, also skeptical about having an Olympic Games for next year, unless probably a good vaccine is coming out in a market or something like that. Yeah. I see. Mike, this might be uh, uh, for you. Um, you know, Hawaii is part of the United States and the U.S. has one of the highest, higher uh, COVID cases. How do we carve out Hawaii from the U.S. and make the Japan travelers feel like it's safe to come to Hawaii? Number one, Hawaii is not one of the contiguous 48 states. And we're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, 2,200 miles away from California. And so we're a unique state. And we have a unique relationship with Japan. So what we're doing with the Japanese government through Governor Ige is providing all our health information, all our statistics and data in very specific format so that they can analyze and look and see how it is different from the rest of the United States. And we're providing that evidence-based data to them to show them um, how we are in Hawaii and we're the safest. And we're also showing our healthcare system and the readiness of our people. So we're making those kind of um, um, communications and representations and through Eric and the governor's office, making those communications um, with the Japanese government to give them that data um, to show that we are unique and different. And I think, we, I believe we can actually be kind of like the domestic market in Japan and it can help our economy and Japan economy recover. And I think there's a mutual benefit from that, that um, can pave the way and then help the whole United States as we go forward. Um, the other thing I wanted to say um, about the Olympics is that I think we all need to get behind Japan. And if Japan can pull off the Olympics, I think the world can recover from COVID. And I think that we can overcome the fear of the virus by, by um, respecting the virus, by having the Olympics take place. And I think that the Olympic theme was, you know, it was about um, the recovery Olympics based upon what happened 10 years ago, you know, with the earthquake. And I think that it's even more meaningful now that I don't think it's just about Japan, it's about the world. And so if we're able to support Japan, I think we all should support Japan in, in carrying out and, and, and holding the Olympics. Because I think that's gonna be the new global marker of how we can do things. And so I think I would also ask all of us in Hawaii you need to strongly support Japan in, in, in succeeding at carrying out those Olympics because that's going to be good for all of us and the travel okay. industry. Mike, uh, you mentioned that the governor has officially reached out to Japan to um, start a dialogue on, on a travel corridor between uh, Japan and Hawaii. Is there anything you can share with us about the conversation that took place? Was it in Japanese? Was it in English? Was, I mean, what, what was said? And, uh, um, how did our governor do? Well, as you know, um, I mean, and I want to thank Eric was there too and our Consul General. And I um, also want to thank Speaker Psyche, who was a very important, he's a leader of the um, Hawaii, Japan, um, Legislative Friendship Organization. So we have deep and strong relationships um, it was a very productive discussion, and they are on a pathway to answering the questions. I think both sides have questions, and I, I would rather leave that to the government leaders. And so, um, and there were questions that I believe could be answered. And like the health data I just told you about are one of the things that we're responding to so that we can make both sides feel comfortable and build um, the relationship and create a travel corridor. And so I, I walked away from those meetings and watching you know, the leaders talk very positively. And um, I would like to share that with everybody that that is happening. So um, please respect that process and let that 
take place because they're doing their due diligence. There's things that we're getting together, even with the health ministry and our health department here to ensure that communication is going to be better than it was in the past. And we're building a, a stronger relationship, even from that level, so that going forward, um, we don't um, have some of the issues that we had in the past. And so um, it, it's very, very positive. And then I would tell you, um, the governor personally, to Eric and, and others, are reaching out to the top industry leaders um, across Japan in the travel industry at the highest levels because we have the relationship with them. And um, I would just tell you that it's, it's warm, it's strong. And, and maybe just to share with everyone that, you know, what Eric and I learned from the last time we were in the Great Recession and we went through big turmoil and then, you know, we had the tsunami. Um, we learned so much from our friends in Japan and the one thing we learned was how to get back to living that we can only mourn and do things for so long and now we have to keep going and the travel industry is important to getting um, our economies back so that life can go back to normal and that was you know so refreshing to hear because we were brought up in a way where we, we wait so many days after certain things happen and we go through this process and um, some of the great leaders in Japan told us and I think this is for us now with the virus we have to start living you know, and, um, and, um, and I think that the world is starting to do that. And I, I think we, Hawaii and Japan actually can be a, a travel corridor that can, can be a model for a lot of other places. Uh, we just want to do it right and successfully. And I think the elements are there. And um, so please just be patient on that, but know that um, we, are, we are, it's a top priority, top priority. Uh, not just for our economy, but for our way of life and bringing things back to normal. And the governor is very, very focused on this. And um, we're grateful that we have help like from people like all of you. And um, and we want to work with you even more closely. So um, I know that you've worked on plans and helped us um, shape things. And I think that's been so valuable. And, um, and it's helped the governor understand things too. And then we use that as part of the communication. It shows that we have the community support and all of your support behind it too. And it's not just government to government or business to business, but the community to community too. And um, so your efforts have helped to back that up. And that came up in the conversations too. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. So uh, I'm afraid our time is uh, almost up. So uh, any closing comments from any of you uh, before uh, I make my closing comments? I'm good. Thank you. Mike? Let's work together and try our best because um, the people that came before us did that and they, they took courage and we owe it to the people who are going to come after us. So I just want to thank everybody and we together we can make it happen. So um, um, we have our commitment to work very hard with you um, to make this successful and possible. Aloha. Oh, thank you. So thank you all for joining us today at our JAS Japan Travel Update. We would like to uh, have your comments about today's presentation. So please write to us and also let us know how JASH can help you survive and thrive during this global pandemic. Remember that we're all in this together and when we choose to come out of it together, we'll all be stronger and better than before. Until then, stay safe, wear a face mask and stay well. Aloha. Aloha, thank you.